begin. Hello, Wombat. I'm over. It's good to see well, you. Hi. First, I got to say hi to the people. Hi, people Talk of about. YouTube, all 40 of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's kind of an impromptu, off-script, off-timeline interview with a recently published author, uh, fighter pilot, E2 pilot, Airbus pilot. Uh, what else do you do? Airbus yeah, T forty five, T forty five guy, Airbus instructor, um, LSO. LSO. Uh, God, what have you not done? Oh, he drives a GT five hundred, which I is do. slow, but I mean it's respectable. It's yeah. slow. I I got fifteen hundred horsepower in my garage, dude. I I I, I can you know. Just if saying. I pull my truck in, I might be close. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for the kids at home, does everyone hear everyone? Do y'all hear me? And do y'all hear uh, Wombat? Gonky, I see you. Uh, Gonky actually just called it a Mustang. So uh, go ahead and get you triggered at the beginning. Uh, everybody says yes. So awesome. Well, welcome. Thanks for uh, showing up on the channel. Before we begin, I, I kind of want to start with your book because this is a big deal. Um, in general, I remember, you know, back in my day when I published my first book, uh, and you and I have been talking about this book forever, uh, and you finally it published it. Uh, the link is in the description, trmatson.com. but tell me a little bit about it. Like, what, what is this, this book about? So it's a uh, military fiction thriller um, that follows an E-2 pilot yep. on a combat deployment um, and just goes through the the norms of being on a ship um, and, and dealing with squadron life and dealing with all the things that come with flying planes built by the lowest bidder off of aircraft carriers and all that. Um, but then there's a little bit of a twist to the story. There's, there's more to it. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't want to give away too much, but uh, there's, of course not. <laughs> it, 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 uh, it, it gives, there, there's something going on. And, and he, the main character needs to figure out what that is and then decide how he's going to handle it. So, so, so one common per, mis, misperception, misconception, uh, obviously this book is a hundred percent about you, right? Like you are the Fiction. main character. I am not the main character <laughs> at all. Uh, sometimes I wish I was, it'd, it'd be kind of cool actually. <laughs> Sometimes fictions, yeah. actually all the time, fiction is better than real life. Um, but I, I will say, I think there's a little bit of every military pilot in the book. Um, yeah. You know, there's, we're, we're just like your books, there's that influence. Um, but yeah. I am not the main character. Um, trust me, I am not. So we, we would call that realistic fiction. You take stories from sure. real life, you kind of make them fiction, you know, names changed for the innocent, all that stuff. Yeah. Don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, all those it, things. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't even have to be 10% true because it's fiction. fiction. 10% truth rule only applies to real stories. Well, cool. So, but it's interesting because your last... Uh, gray jet tour uh, tactical flying assignment was actually the Hornet and your first was the E2. Um, what made you decide to write about the E2 and not like a Hornet story or a T-45 story or something else from your career? Well, um, I think I wanted to be able to go somewhere with this and not just start at the end. So you yeah. kind of have to start at the beginning and then um, you can Google it. There's not any stories out there about the E2. We're, That's it's, true. It's the unsung hero. And, and I think because of that, um, this book appeals to a lot of people. You know, As you know, as a military pilot, I, I think we'd be lying to ourselves if every military pilot out there, even for a brief moment, didn't think, Man, I'd like to fly jets. You know, now there's various reasons why maybe they strayed from that, whether it's family, whether it's, you know, hey, I can't handle, um, you know, the flipping upside down, the air sickness. Maybe it's just not for me. Maybe I'm not quite good enough. There's a lot yeah. of factors. Um, but everybody that's been a military pilot or, or really that's wanted to be a military pilot, I think, um, kind of had that thought at least once, right? And mm -hmm. But there's, as you also know, the vast majority of military pilots across all branches 
don't fly fighters. They just don't. Now, in our world, our buddies did because that's the world we hung out in. But in the reality of it, if you looked at this, the statistics of it, the majority don't. So I think a little bit, while there's a little bit of every military aviator in this book or aviator in general in this book, um, the fact that it's not that story, not to say that maybe there's going to be a sequel, that maybe there is that story, but, um, you know, to start out, it gives it some place to go. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome. And the reviews so far have been very good. Um, Surprisingly good. No, I'm I, I, uh, I, they I, have I, been. No. been good. I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, a wide array of different people reading it. Um, you know, not just good reviews from your typical, hey, I was in yeah. your squadron type people, right. but people that have no military background, no aviation background. Um, things like that. So that was professional that was reviews. Cool. Yeah. You did also have the one review that said that, uh, what call sign usage is not realistic. And the yeah, there was one review. Um, <laughs> it was, it was very funny. Uh, I believe the quote was, I can't believe for a second that military pilots would not speak to each other in their rank and last name. Uh -huh. and he, he says, as it says, Wombat, right next to his, <laughs> his name underneath there. And as you yeah. know, I've known people for decades that I have no idea what their first name is. We used to do First Name Friday, and it was like, a, you know, it was a shot at the bar, you know, if you didn't know their first name. And most people were hammered drunk by the end of the day because nobody yeah, knew anybody's it first was, name. It was, uh, <laughs> in that same review, which I thought was very funny, is one of the... Um, <laughs> one of the other characters in the book is loosely based off of uh, somebody I've known for quite some time and, and deployed with, with his permission. Oh, it's Gonky. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's obviously Gonky. Gonky's in every book. He's in my book. No, in your no, books, no, no. It's no, fine. This, Gonky, this character Gonky actually likes that. Boy, Gonky did like one detachment and <laughs> so, shots and fired. That, Ooh. That is payback for the Mustang comment. But, Ooh, um, Ooh Gonky, the, uh, the better get on here and defend this. yourself. <laughs> is the uh, is the counterpart to the main character in the book. And this same review talked about how in fiction, the author's job is to make the story realistic. And clearly a character like that could not exist. Uh, and mm -hmm. I sent that review to my buddy and he almost fell off his chair laughing because he realizes <laughs> that it's about him. I actually had to tone him down for the book. Yeah. The real yeah. life character is, is much. Well, larger. the truth is always stranger than fiction. You know, I've, I've, I've seen and heard and done stuff that they're like, it, nobody would believe it. They're like, this, this just, it can't happen. You know, it's. Exactly. Uh, but going back to that. So you did start with the E2 and you, um, you started out your career, you were a college grad, right? You, or sorry, Carl, everybody's yeah. a college grad, but you were a normal college grad, not an academy uh, no, grad, no right? Academy how, how, how did you get your start in military aviation? The real story or the politically correct one? <laughs> oh, um, God, is this, is this a, uh, okay, well, I mean. We, uh, well, it's funny. Um, I went to a military high school and had no desire to join the military after that. Um, okay. And did a year of college in Pennsylvania and realized that I had really no drive or desire. Mm -hmm. um, so I transferred to a more military school. And um, one day I was, I was walking back from class and I was in the ROTC unit at this school and uh, the company commander uh, is probably about noon weekday mm -hmm. he's up on his balcony having a beer and calls me up and just trying to get to know me you know new new guy in the unit and uh and he asked me he's like what do you want to do in the in the navy and at the time i had no idea and and, and he said uh well would you want to fly airplanes and my comment which is embarrassing uh was the navy <laughs> has airplanes? I, I didn't even know I, mean, I didn't at that point in my life you know, we've all watched Top Gun. We all thought that was cool, but I just hadn't pieced that together in my brain. Um, and I looked at him and I was like, yeah, I, that'd be cool. Let's do that. Yeah. And Why not? I mean, on, got nothing better to do. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. From that point on, I, I, um, I focused on aviation much like uh, a lot of our friends have, you know, 100%, nothing else mattered and, and ended up graduating four years later, uh, with an aviation slot to Pensacola. So nice. No nice. background in my family. My dad wasn't a pilot. Uh, nothing like that. Just 
Wow. And, and so you went to Pensacola. Uh, what were they flying back then? T-34s? So Pensacola for me was just API. Okay. And then uh, I believe, and I will never forget when the selection came out, Gonky was sitting in front of me and so that's how you met gonky okay that is did you he was in did front you have of me to drag him through like actually get it, help him through everything because he wasn't was a fast swimmer in APM. <laughs> that. like sunk. Oh, wait is that a euphemism or is that literally he could not swim fast maybe a little bit of both uh but he was sitting in front of me when they when they send around the sheet uh, and you have to tell me what he says because I don't, I can't see the comments. So I'm sure he's just fine. Uh, I think he's off doing real estate now. He yeah, gave up on us. Um, so they send around the sheet, you know, of where you're going for primary. And I fully expected to be staying in Pensacola at Whitey Field. Uh, yeah. Donkey was ahead of me before he was gone. And uh, he's like, where's Vance Air Force Base? So, of course, I start laughing at him, telling him how horrible it is to be a Navy guy going to Vance. Uh, he hands me the sheet and I learned instant karma. Because uh, I was also going to Vance Air Force Base, so uh, we carpooled up to sunny Enid, Oklahoma, and Enid, America. Out. It's uh, all it's three of us. All three of us went to Enid. That's yeah, amazing. Physically, as far away from an ocean as you can get as a Navy guy, which is problem number one. Uh, but it was really good training. I I started on T thirty seven, the tweet, uh, and um, and then from there. You know, barely hung on through flight school. I uh, had all sorts of air sickness problems and things like that uh, that that uh, took a lot to get through. But how how did you get through? I mean, a lot of people ask about this question. How how do you get? How did you overcome air sickness? You don't give up. Basically, yeah. That's that's the short answer of it. Um, many days. Uh, as you know, advance, you know, you fly and sometimes you fly twice a day, every day. Uh, they have a very strict schedule. And for me, I never flew twice a day initially because I would fly, go throw up, finish the flight, maybe not finish the flight. And then I'd get sent over to uh, aviation physiology and yeah. get strapped into that chair that they spun me around in an attempt to finish throwing. The parany chair? Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and then they would write up a whole report on me and I'd go back to the squadron and study. And the next day I would do it all over again. And I threw up every flight until my solo. To was this in my summertime? Or my solo. So. Oh God, the check ride. Yeah. Wow. Was this summertime? We got there. No, it was oh. colder weather. Because I was thinking maybe hot weather, you know, those tweet, not very great on the air conditioning. No, I, I honestly, um, I think it was nerves. Hundred yeah. percent, because um, I got through my uh, safer solo flight, <laughs> which is a story in of itself. And uh, we'll go and, on. Well, a story. This is you know how many flights before you solo twelve or something. You can't say it's a story without telling the story. That's I think and, it's in the Geneva Convention. Yeah. The uh, so we're going out there, and you know you remember when you do a check ride, you go to the different area, you bring your training jacket and. It's a big deal, right? You don't get checked out by your own instructors. And so I walked down to the, whatever they called it, the, you know, where all the check instructors were. And uh, I sat down or checked in with this instructor and he was very intimidating. And he looks through my record and he looks up and he said, uh, looks like you have some air sick problems. I was like, yeah. If, uh, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking if throwing up on every flight is an air sick problem, then... Yeah, I got some air sick problems. And yeah, we'll uh, call it that. Yeah. So he said, now is a Friday, right? Friday uh, early afternoon. And he said, you know, if you have to give me the controls so you, you know, to get sick, you fail your flight. And I was like, okay. He goes, and the understanding with that is, is tomorrow, you know, or next week, you're going to be out there solo. There's nobody to give the plane to. Which, you know, naturally I think of that and I go, well, yeah, but I'm probably not going to do anything that makes myself sick on a solo right. as well. But, All right. Uh, no room for logic. So we go out and we fly and, um, first thing, and you remember the training. First thing we do is, uh, uh, you know, there's no warm up on my safer solo right into a spin. He was trying to get me sick. And, uh, so we go do a spin and come out of it and I felt fine. So I was like, hmm. so he goes, give me another. One. Okay. Do another one. Feel fine. Give me an inverted spin. If you remember those and, Ooh, and I'm like, I, don't, I don't remember we did those in the T6. Yeah. But yeah. Well, T37s we did. 
and, yeah. uh, and it was a, it would flip itself over and it was it was fairly violent so uh he said give me you know give me an inverted spin I'm like here we go do an inverted spin and he kind of is sitting there and in the t37 they're right next to you you know it's it's the darth vader mask and he goes you could see he was almost dejected you know like he wanted to get me sick so we'd go back to base so he'd go make a tea time or start his weekend and it just wasn't going to happen so he's just like all right man uh he goes you know, I guess give me a loop. And as I'm starting downward to set up for this loop, it just, the, the feeling comes over me and I know it's coming. And cause at that point I was actually really good at knowing when I was going to get sick. Um, but I was, I was determined that I was not going to give up the aircraft. So I'd actually uh, chair flown this in my room on base prior to this flight of how I was going to handle this. And uh, so I'm pulling back on the stick, going vertical through this loop and I reach down in my G-suit pocket and I pull out a barf bag and there's an eyeball vent right here. I'll never forget it. My best friend. And I flip it open and it fills up the bag and I drop my mask and I start throwing up upside down. Uh, he's standing right or sitting right here, just staring at me. Uh, I'm trying to fly the best I can. I finish throwing up. I kind of half twist it up and throw it back in my G-suit pocket as I pull out of the bottom of the loop and throw my mask back on. Go straight and level. And he is just, I mean, the whole time I could tell he's staring at me. And finally he breaks the silence and he goes, or I did, I was like, well, sir, what maneuver would you like to see next? And he goes, dude, I'll tell you, I have no idea what your loop just looked like, but that was amazing. He's like, you pass, do whatever you want. And that was it. I never got sick again. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Holy so I crap, have no on that. inverted vomit loop. In the T-37. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Gonky actually chimed in in the comments and said, Wombat can puke and fly at the same time. Check flight verified. He had said that before you told the story. So, so yeah. So, that was... Um, wow. I dealt with that. And, and the bottom line, I tried everything on the planet. Gonky could tell you, and I'm sure he'll comment. Uh, ginger snaps. And, I mean, every possible thing. Yeah. Ginger root eat. extract. Yeah. Ginger. Yep. Yeah. And none of it did anything other than make it taste better when it came back up. Was it that, manifestation my, of apprehension? It, is that what it, what it ended up being? I think so. I really do. Yeah. Um, you know, without having a background in aviation and I, I had put so much pressure on myself to be successful. Um, yeah. I know you, you know, if for no that. other reason, <laughs> I, I do, I yeah. still do, but you know, yeah, what? I know, it's, I know it's gotten me. Um, yeah. It's, it's works. It works. It, it does. So I might, you know, pop an artery at 50 from stress, but it works for now. So we'll just keep doing what works for now. Uh, we'll worry about that later. Um, but yeah, it was just, I wanted to, you know, when, when we checked into Vance, the attrition rate for Navy guys was, was through the roof. And whether that was because of who was going up there or because of the disconnect between the Air Force and the uh, the Navy, you know, and I, I don't really know what it was, but I mean, the class ahead of us, like two guys graduated that were Navy Marine guys. I don't Both got helicopters. Yeah. There was, well, a couple had rolled in. So a bunch of had tried it out of there. Um, both Jesus. got helicopters and both of them had a ton of civilian time. <laughs> and here I am zero hours. I mean, first flight was in a T-37 ever. So, you know, uh, I already feel like I'm behind, you know, and, and um, so, yeah. And I mean, if for no other reason, you know, you could put the things like failure for family, you know, my name, my reputation, but it could have yeah. just been as simple as I had a truck payment now and I didn't know how I was going to pay for that, you know, or I didn't want to go drive ships in the Navy and that might be where I ended up if I didn't get through flight school. Yeah. So yeah, that is scary. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yes. So it's terrifying. Um, uh, so yeah. So you got through that, and then I guess you made jet grades, right? Because you ended up in T-45s? Yeah, so back then, a little bit different than now, um, <clears throat> at least the last I know. Now you basically select carrier, helo, or maritime, or some variant of that. Um, back then, you actually selected, you know, you put the full thing. So jets, Meridian jets, Kingsville, E2C2, uh, P3s at the time, helos. Um, and I basically put them in that order. I, I put, you know, Jets, I forget, you know, Kingsville, Jets Meridian, E2s, and then um, Helos and P3s, I think is what I put. 
And right before our selection day, uh, there was a Navy commander there who was in charge of all the Navy guys. And he asked me, he pulled me aside. He goes, why'd you put E2C2 over, um, you know, helos and P3s? And, and I was like, well, you know, to me, naval aviation is about being on the ship. So if I can't fly jets, um, I at least want to be on a ship. And the week that, that I happened to select, there wasn't any jet grades. And I know everybody says that, but it was legit. You know, there was no jet slots. Um, every, you know, you talk to anybody who's been through flight school, there was never any jet slots their week, right? Especially in the Navy, but there just wasn't. And um, so, and I think Donkey was like a week ahead and, and he got fighters and, and deserved it, frankly. And, and uh, so they actually had to pull a string. The, the commander told me, he's like, there was no E2C2 slots either, but I liked your answer. So I called and we got you one. So. Wow. Well, good for you. Know, you. So yeah. I ended up going, going through that pipeline. So. But you still ended up going with Gonky to T-45s, right? That Yeah, we split for a little bit. I had to go to Corpus Christi first to learn how to fly the uh, T-44 um, okay. to get my multi-engine time, mm -hmm. uh, which was a super quick syllabus. <laughs> I mean, you know, four, six, four to six months, you're down there. You just get your multi-engine time. Is that uh, a King Air? You know, what's that? Is that the King Air? The... King Air, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So doing some single engine stuff and then right down to Kingsville, ultimately for the carrier qualification uh, phase. That's really why the E2 guys, you know, we do a little bit of, you know, phase one is all just learning how to fly the plane and all that. And then a little bit of formation, um, but then right into carrier quals because um, wow. the T45 at the time is the only plane that, that you carry your qual in. So um, yeah, did that. Did not be. Right. Aren't they? Yeah, that yeah. breaks my heart a little bit. So it'll just all be automatic and it'll work just fine. And the, don't worry. About it. it'll that'll be, be your uh, topic for the ready room for Gonkey's channel, which yeah. that, that'll yeah, be a good one to talk about uh, we'll the lack of that. lack of carrier quals. But so uh, you went to the E2 um, out of there. Where was your where'd you go? Where where is the E2? Uh, so the the FRS, if you will, or RAG or whatever you want to call it, depending on who you are, uh, is in Norfolk, Virginia. So went there. Uh, they put 10 of us in a room. They said, there's eight E2s and two C2s, figure it out. So we did. I wanted E2s at that point um, because there was a crazy part of me that wanted to land on the ship at night. I don't know why. I wish I would have rethought that. Uh, but so I just, you know, right off the bat, I raised my hand and said, I want E2s. And that was it. I was done. So that was my day. Um, and then I went through that training, um, and we end that training with carrier quals as well. So I finished, uh, I was not the strongest. I was about mid pack, uh, grade wise going into the actual ship, uh, from all the field work. Um, but I ended up calling prior, they call it pri a priority a, uh, which gets you either a Japan spot, which I didn't really want or an immediate ticket to go meet a squadron, which is what I got. So um, I got back and a couple of days after carrier quals, I was on a plane to, to Australia to meet my first squadron. Oh, so, okay. Which, wow. which sounds great. And it was, and wow. I feel bad for them. I met them. I got off the plane at 8 AM the morning after they pulled into port for the first time in like three months. <laughs> oh. Did you get to meet Margot Robbie? I did not. I um, do that. Yeah. But maybe for the movie. Nicole Kidman, yeah. I mean, any of these, I mean, any uh, one of these would be great for Treason Flight the movie. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Gonky has to have a character for the movie. <laughs> he is a character. And now, is uh, any of your pilot training stuff? Yeah, not yours, but does the book cover any you know pilot training stuff? Does your character go through the same path as you? I think he the main character does up to that point because uh, it's an E two pilot, so it's easy. So he's he's an Air Force Enid guy. That um, I don't. There wasn't as much focus on the flight school stuff. Um, it was really we 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 meet the main character on deployment. So any talk about flight school, anything like that, it's flashbacks to it or an incident that happened. But there's really not the the pure lineal path right of, right right you start at graduation day and end it where we end so yeah yeah, um, yeah the focus was more on the the deployment the combat deployment part of it so how did you like flying the e2 i love it actually 
Um, it's your first love, right? You know, you always remember it. Um, it's not an easy plane to fly. That's for sure. I mean, anything with, uh, and, and it, it, you could see it behind me in the picture. It's obviously very sexy looking. Um, but <laughs> the, uh, you get a plane that has, you know, non counter rotating props. The amount of P factor in that is, is insane. Oh, wow. uh, it's got four tails, but three rudders. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting. It's got piece. a big hat. It's, it's got a hat, which it's is like cool. a state trooper. It's got a big it old is, state yeah. trooper hat. Yeah. On the top. Um, yeah. So it, it took <laughs> you legitimately three, four, 500 hours before you were truly comfortable flying. Unlike the Hornet, which took like three or four flights. And then you, yoke? Could, and you could go out and fly. It's got a yoke. Oh, wow. Yep. Um, it's got a yoke, twin engine. Uh, it had um, different rudder settings for depending on how fast you were flying it, which is interesting. So No yaw damper? Just You just had to set it? You set it. Your yaw dampener was your feet. Hey, and, man, the T-38's I mean, got a yaw damper. Yeah. Uh, the, like the autopilot um, was basically an altitude hold. I mean, there was it, it was very, very, very rudimentary steam so. gauges i mean nothing no fancy. the one i flew yeah it was it was all steam gauges we did uh believe it or not not even like um weather radar or anything like that up front you would think with that big thing that the pilots would have situational awareness to everything nothing. we had a lightning strike indicator made by bf goodrich okay for you not kidding yeah. and uh what i learned from that is that they should stick to tires because right. it, was, it was not the best situational awareness as far as uh, where lightning was. But yeah. Um, but yeah, once you got it, it was a really rewarding plane. It wasn't easy to land on the ship. Uh, you know, 85 foot landing area wide with an 80 foot wingspan on the plane. So uh, I got a buddy who actually took off about two foot of his right wing on a bolter one night. Holy crap. Went through the tail of two super hornets on the bow on the bolter and, and he lived. Yep. Uh, the tech reps came out to the ship and said that if he took off another inch or two of the wing, they would have had a catastrophic hydraulic failure. Well, I mean, Kurt Russell did it in executive decision. So obviously that. that's realistic. Yeah. It so, is. Obviously we've come full circle here. Um, yeah. so of your time before we move forward, what is your best or scariest or both story flying the E2? Um, I think the scariest I will leave for you to read the book because fair I enough. will go out and tell people, I think it's fair to say, while it's a fiction book, the prologue happened. Okay. That's a real story. And the prologue's on your website. You don't even have to buy the book. You don't. You, can do the pro you should. You're like a, well, but you're like a crack dealer. You feed them a little bit and then... They buy it. So the prologue is on your website. It is. A great Jeremy military Madsen. author taught me that trick, actually. I can't remember his name. Yeah, yeah, anyway. Probably um, Vince Flynn or somebody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, the, um, ghost, the ghost of Tom Clancy. But continue. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so that was probably the scariest in the, in the Hawkeye. Um, I do remember one story that sticks out. I just met my, um, my squadron. We pull out of Australia. Uh, this is about the time, and, and I'm sure your viewers could, could Google this because it's been a while now, that PBS did a special called Carrier, and it was a multi-episode oh, special. Oh, yeah. That was my first plane. Were you on there? Are you famous? Briefly, but you'll never know it, and I won't point it out. So um, the I'm going to have to ruin that now. I have to <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> uh, but there's a pitching de deck episode of that special and it was right around when we were in australia and coming out of australia um so very similar conditions and my first night trap in the fleet uh was was funny you know you you do your carrier qualifications in the training command in, in uh, vaw 120 and it's it's very benign you know when you do it in the t-45 it's basically com -sies. and then you go to the 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 fleet uh replacement squadron and it's a little bit, they have a little bit more 
uh, sea state they can handle. And then once you get to the fleet, all bets are off. You're a fleet pilot. So I remember very vividly coming in after we pulled out of port, I was flying with a maintenance officer who is a phenomenal E2 pilot in my right seat. And we're probably six, seven miles behind a ship. Beautiful clear night. Uh, full moon, which is the worst conditions because you could see everything and your stand breaks down because you start looking. And I guess they were doing a, a, a FOD walk down or something. Uh, they were looking for a part on the flight deck. So they light up the flight deck. I mean, every light's on and we're at seven miles coming in. And I remember looking up at the aircraft carrier and I watch it roll to where I can see the 68 on the left side of the tower of the island. And as I'm watching it, it does a Dutch roll to where I could see the 68 on the other side. Oh boy. And it shocked me because I'm supposed to land on that in a couple minutes or a couple seconds. And I looked over at my co-pilot being the new guy in the squadron. And I was like, did you see that? And all I remember is his big eyes. And he just says like, fly your instruments. Cause it's, <laughs> don't look at me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I still believe he pretty much flew 90% of that pass from the right seat without me realizing it, influencing things. But it was, uh, it was, it was very eye opening, you know? Um, and the same thing happened in the Hornet in, in different aspects, but it's very eye opening when you come out of training and you're out there now and it's, it's time to do your job, you know? And yeah. You don't have a choice. There's no place to go land that thing. We can't mid air refuel it. You got to get it back on deck and you got the rest of your life to figure out how, I guess. I don't know. So no ejection but, seat also. No, um, the NFOs in the back would have been really upset as they hit that dome trying to punch out. So, and now as pilots, we tried to say, you know, but if you could save two of five, is it worth it? And yes. uh, they said no. So, <laughs> so no ejection seat. Uh, we did, we did uh, have parachutes in the seats so you could bail out of it if you had to. Oh, and that's, that's just more uncomfortable. That's just more crap to wear. It, it was not a comfortable seat. Um, it was not, we kind of all joked. I mean, I'm not a tiny guy. It, it was funny to, to get through the, the hallway to be able to bail out of that thing. I, was, I figured I was going to have radios and stuff attached to me as I jumped out, you know, trying to get through there. Um, and then as the pilots, we had ditching hatches above our heads uh, if we went off into the water uh, off catapult. And then the NFOs had one ditching hatch in the back that they would actually take out before we would launch off the ship. Um, because they wouldn't be able to get it out quick enough. So, wow. Wow. Well, interesting. so how did you end up going from that to flying Hornets? Um, so I was an LSO as well in my E2 squadron. Uh, what is an LSO go. for those of us? Landing that... signals officer. Okay. So the guy okay. that stands out in the back of the ship gets a really cool, uh, sunglass tan, uh, probably Wait. loses, yeah, yeah, paddles, if you will. Angels in white. There's a lot of really enduring. One-eyed pig, something. Uh, about something that. about pigs. I don't remember that yeah, one. I do uh, remember the angels yeah. in white. That one, that yeah. one sticks. I'm sure somebody will write the other one. Uh. <laughs> Gawky says your scariest Wombat story is a Fox 1 kill advance, actually. He corrected you. <laughs> I don't agree with that. Um, <laughs> it was a coyote, and it was his fault. So... Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, what's that story? We're ADD, man. I got to know about this Fox One kill. So, advance. as you know, Gonky likes cars as well as we all do. Um, yeah, and old he cars. Had, he got stuck in the eighties. Gonky didn't. He's grow still up with there. The rest of us. Yeah, he uh, hasn't left. So he uh, he had his has. I'm sorry. Twenty years later, he still has his right the Camaro, Camaro mm -hmm. I Rock Z that he would drag race. Um, and it was, I believe, a Friday night. He uh, he drove it out to Tulsa uh, to go drag race, and in typical Gonky fashion, broke his car to where he couldn't drive it back. So he called me, asked me if I could uh, come out and get him. So I hopped in my truck with another uh, classmate of ours, and we drove out there, picked him up, and on the way back, I mean, you know, Oklahoma roads dead straight. Uh, nothing going on and I'm uh, driving, you know, 75 miles an hour in my GMC pickup at the time and uh, out, out darts a fox in the road um, and uh, uh, did not stand a chance. I believe the point of impact was the temple of the fox hit the toe hook recovery. Oh. Um, 
I do think that somebody may have screamed uh, in a very high pitched voice. It was gonky. It was not me. Uh, we got that thing. Uh, we took it to the car wash after and there was fur from that tow hook all the way to my back exhaust pipe. And that was truly my first military kill, I guess. So, oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, anyway, so back to your story on getting to the Hornet from the E2. Sure. Uh, so as an LSO, you get to know a lot of people. Um, it was always kind of in my mind that I still wanted to fly jets at this point. Um, so while I was in my A2 squadron, I did everything I could. I got all my qualifications, you know, there's different levels, just like there is in the Hornet. So I worked my way up to getting my, uh, level four qual, uh, which is the highest you can get. I also was getting, um, my, uh, my wing qual as an LSO, which is the highest you can get. I was also working on my master's degree on the side on deployment because I figured that would help me. I was doing everything I possibly could, um, to essentially make my resume, if you will, look good in hopes that maybe one day I would get the opportunity. And uh, one day I was walking out to, uh, to catch some aircraft uh, on deployment and our CAG uh, commander of the air group was walking the other way. Um, he was a, he was a old school fighter pilot and um, former skipper of the actual Top Gun school and, and all that. And, uh, and he grabbed me and he said, you know, Hey, well, I got a question for you. And, you know, I knew him because I would grade his landings, you know, and I would debrief him and all that. And that was kind of a cool thing about the NL. So, and, uh, you know, what's that, sir? And he's like, have you ever wanted to fly jets just out of the blue in the passageway of the Nimitz? And me being me, I was like, well, sir, you know, once you've flown the Hawkeye, that's kind of the pinnacle. And in, in typical old school fighter pilot fashion, he looked at me and he was like, OK. And he walks away and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. time out. I was kidding. I was kidding. Come back. Yeah. Get over here. Uh, Sarcasm was lost, and uh, he asked me to come meet him, and I talked to him, and he said they were opening up. They opened up two transition boards over the next six months um, because the Navy had kind of mismanaged their manning numbers. No, not the Navy. I know. I know. Um, <laughs> not the Navy. No, I know. So uh, they basically opened up boards that were for you know, more senior lieutenants at that point. And uh, I applied. I got the endorsement of my CAG, the skipper of the Nimitz, a whole bunch of other people, uh, eventually got, you know, got picked up and went, it, it took a process and I was already in Kingsville as an instructor, um, teaching. Oh, you were T-45s instructor? T-45s. I went down to Kingsville and was, uh, I found out, I think two months into a three year short tour that I got picked up and, um, basically got my choice. They're like, what coast do you want to go to for training? And do you want to go Hornets or Super Hornets? And I told them I wanted to wow. go Hornets on the East Coast. So, Why Hornets over Super Hornets? There was, to me, the Hornet has the legacy name for a reason. You know, there's, there's history to that aircraft. And I'm not saying that the Super Hornets are not a great aircraft and will have its history. Just at the time to me, you know, you look back at the wars the Hornet has fought and the mission the Hornet had. And, 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 you know, again, it was, it was a legacy. Um, and I would be lying if I said that there wasn't some aspect to the fact that we do not have deployable two seat Hornets. So in my mind, I wanted to fly single seat, um, now there's anything wrong with NFOs or backseaters. Well, you just had eight people anymore. back there for the last however yeah, many years. I, so, I mean, it's time for some peace and quiet. I had flown the party bus, um, and that was <laughs> cool. Uh, I ultimately, but ultimately what it had come down to, and, and I, I found out on a Friday that I had gotten a transition, and my skipper down in Kingsville told me to go home, think about it, and come back. He was a Hornet guy, single-seat Hornet guy, and, and – uh, I thought about it and it, it boiled down to, you know, I wanted to either succeed or fail at this phase of my life based on my merit alone. I, I yeah. didn't want to rely on somebody in the back helping me. You know, I, if, if the bombs got on target, if I shot down the right airplane, if I found the tanker, if I got back on the ship, I wanted it to be on me. And if I didn't, so there was, this was kind of, I figured my one shot to, um, to, to do this and, I didn't want to be an old man going, well, I could have done it if I had better X, Y, and Z. So, yeah. So I picked Hornets. I wanted to go East Coast because I had family out there and that was that. So, 
Well, so how was that tour? How, how, and how long did you stay in the Hornet? Uh, basically the same amount of time. Um, so I went out to the East Coast, BFA 106, learned how to fly the Hornet. Uh, again, we finished with the ship. I called Priority A again. Ended up uh, going across the coast to Lemoore, California uh, to meet my squadron that was getting ready for a deployment, VFA 97. Um, did a set of workups with them, did a deployment with them. Uh, and about some point towards the end of that deployment, I uh, had a medical issue uh, where I was joining up on a tanker at night and saw two tankers, which is not ideal for trying to get fuel off of them. I mean, if you pick the right one, I mean... <laughs> True. So <laughs> I, uh, I picked the right one, got my gas, and then they talked to me back aboard the ship. And then that was my last flight in the Hornet. Um, and I ended up having to go back stateside, get a whole bunch of stuff done. Um, ultimately, it saved my life, which was pretty cool uh, in hindsight. Good to have and you. Otherwise, we would not have Treason Flight extra. available now anywhere ebooks are available. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so ultimately, uh, that was awesome. That's a wonderful, shameless plug. Um, yeah, I, I'm here for you, man. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so got the medical stuff all taken care of, and uh, got med back up. And at that point, you know, I had done everything at, at that time. You know, I checked all the boxes in fighters. You know, I'd done the tanking, dropped the bomb, shot the gun, shot the missile. You know, done low levels. So my career path was so far off the rails at that point that. Um, I had realized, you know, 10 plus years in the Navy that I really enjoyed teaching. I got a taste for it when I was in Kingsville and I really enjoyed it. Uh, so I had an opportunity to actually go to Meridian uh, and teach again in the T-45 and become the wing LSO. So my job for my last couple of years active duty was essentially taking all those students like yeah. myself years prior out to the ship for the first time, getting them carrier qualified. Uh, and that was a, that was an awesome tour. Uh, that really was to just to see that to see that no matter what has changed over a decade and you know in in personalities and stuff that that day when you carry your qual everybody's the same person. They're just they're they're just so happy to be there. And, yeah, um, you know, you're you're truly a naval aviator at that point. You know, and, and do that. So it was it was a really rewarding tour. And then at that point, my active duty time in the navy was out. Uh, it was time to go on to the friendlier, friendlier skies, if you will. But and what skies were those? <laughs> so, so now uh, fly and teach for a major airline. Um, but again, did the flying for a couple of years as a, and I also was a reservist down in Pensacola during that time. Um, but then still just kind of longed for that teaching and was able to figure out how to transfer that skill set over to the civilian sector. And now I also teach for a major airline, which is really rewarding and allows me to kind of scratch that itch, but also be home a little bit more for the family. And yeah. What, maybe what, impart uh, some wisdom, maybe. What kind of what kind of aerospace vehicle are you teaching? Airbuses. So 19s, 20s, 21s. That is my nice. yeah. I am a French of you. I, you know, I converted to the French side and I love it. <laughs> yeah. So much I mean, more room for activities. Well, that's, I mean. I, there's a snack tray. It trims yeah. for you. Uh, Dude, I, well, I, everything. It's made, it makes a good pilot average and a bad pilot average. It's just yeah, everybody's exactly. average. And I'm not telling you which one I was, but it did make me average. So. <laughs> well, obviously, based on the fact that you're very good at landing, I'm going to say you were a good pilot. A wise friend of mine who's probably still on the chat once said in the Hornet, you're either really good at landing on the ship or really good at tanking. Those are yeah. your two options in the Navy. And I didn't enjoy tanking much. So I made sure right. that I got back aboard. So. Well, turning to the chat, you guys start posting your questions for Wombat. We'll, we'll do a, a Q and a here for the next 15 or 20 minutes. Um, but while we wait for the chat to populate, there was a question. It was from, it was a super chat, uh, about, me doing an interview with the guys in F-14. I am going to get more Tomcat people, so stand by on that. But Wombat is our focus. Wombat, why are you Wombat? Oof, I don't know if that is a story that is made for TV. Um, well, I mean, 
people still don't know why gonky is gonky so yeah and that's probably also a good idea so certain <laughs> call signs you, you, just, you don't uh, have like a g-rated version of your call sign most people do not really not, not really you know because gonky likes to gonculate because he's a very smart man yeah that's the g-rated version <laughs> Do your viewers believe that? Is that? <laughs> I, I I think they do. I don't know. I mean, I, well, I would they never should. lie to them. Right, I mean, they should. We're, <laughs> we're highly highly trustworthy people. We would never have a call sign that's incredibly offensive. True. Let's just say, how about I met my first squadron in Australia? So there you go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Cameron would like to know. Um, well, first of all, it's Josh. Helicopter stuff is coming back. I'm supposed to go back and start flying again on Saturday. Thank God. Good. It's been so long. It's been three months. Um, Wombulate, somebody says. <laughs> Did, um, you didn't tell us this yet, I don't think. Your scariest story in a jet, period. So it doesn't have to be. I know we talked a little scary story in the E2, but what is your scariest uh, aircraft story? that you can think of there's so many um and honestly <laughs> not, to plug, not to plug the website but uh there are i do write some articles on there of some things i've been through um that, yeah. that some people may find and you post it on your facebook as well everything is under tr like, matson i do so yeah facebook is, is it, uh tr matson it, instagram is it facebook.com slash tr matson did you go do the thing or yes. are you still like yeah. two thousand numbers that you got to remember okay no, no there's no numbers it's easy to find um, okay. But I would say probably the legit, gosh, there's so many, um, which is not good, I guess, but I'm here. I had a, an incident in the Hornet um, where I took a cat shot at night and lost everything. Uh, I lost all my electrics completely. I thought I had flamed out both motors on the cat. Um, because as you know, in the Hornet, you know, everybody thinks it's loud and it is, but you have your headset on and your, yeah. you know, ear protection and helmet. So when and, and, and all the noise yeah. is behind you, you know, it's not. Um, so I hit the end of the cat stroke and everything went black. HUD displays all the lights. Done. Spatial you D know. city. Yeah. Good Lord. Yeah. Luckily uh, it was, um, it was not a dark or it was a dark night, but luckily there was a discernible horizon. And, and but there was a brief second where I had to decide if I was getting out of the plane right there. I mean, you're 60 feet off the off the water. Um, and for whatever reason, I didn't. Um, I, I remember instructors telling us, you know, no fast hands, right? So I was like, all right. And I basically I was already an afterburner. Um, so I just pulled back on the stick. And as I saw my world kind of sinking away from me, I, I stuck with it. And um, I think it was, I have no idea the altitude because I didn't have any readings, but I think it was about 10,000 feet. I could finally see the horizon and see that I wasn't going to hit the water and leveled off and came out of burner. And I'll never forget it. You know, we're up on uh, departure frequency and the air boss of the, of the Stennis goes, all right, 301, uh, when, when you find that seat cushion that clearly you've lost, you let us know when you want to talk about what's wrong with your jet. And I was like, <laughs> and we troubleshot and we were able to get one display back. And I came back aboard the ship like that. But that moment no um, was, that was pretty scary. No, HUD. Yeah. I, I've had, you know, I've had way too many no HUD landings in the Hornet. It was funny. Uh, I went through oh. my initial carrier qualification and there was a problem with the HUD that when I would take a cat shot, it would unseat itself and blank out. And then when I would trap, it would reseat itself. So I had like six no HUD landings as my initial qual. And of course they're all like, well, he's an E2 guy. He can handle it because we don't have a HUD in the E2. Uh, and I will tell you that that is vastly different. <laughs> because <laughs> the E2, how to not have a HUD. So um, yeah, I think that was one of the, the scarier ones, but, but I write about them. I think it's important to write about stuff like that, you know, for, for new aviators to, to learn, hopefully. And if they're in a similar situation to, um, to know that there's a way out, you know, but, yeah. but there's a lot. There's, we, we flew planes built by the lowest bidder, right? So there's well, problems. This, the approach speed similar. Uh, what's the E2? The, the E2 is actually similar to a Super Hornet behind the ship. So it would be, depending on the weight, 
120 to 130 knots. The Hornet was, was faster. The Hornet was yeah. 150, 160, uh, coming in behind the ship. So, uh, all right. So moving on to the questions, Barry asks, what is the E2 story? The intercept. Do you know what that means? Yeah. Okay, I don't either. Moving on, uh, Jason asks, when Navy pilots go to the boat the first time in the T-45 or their fleet aircraft, are they going with you as an instructor or are they going single seat? There's not an instructor in the Navy that would you could pay enough to sit in the back of that aircraft. <laughs> so Pass. your yeah. first time at the, uh, at the ship in a T-45 is so, um, period. Just, that's just yeah. the way it is. We, lead, we get let out as... Uh, as instructors, we would do a division flight out with three solo students. You'd bring them into the break, say goodbye to them, and they would go about their business. And the LSOs had them at that point. Uh, now, I will tell you when we got to the uh, FRS for the E2, you know, now you have another pilot with you. That is a, an instructor. Uh, those men and women, I take my hat off to because I could not imagine what it would be like. Because uh, I'm pretty sure my first two night landings in the E2 was about 99% the person sitting next to me, making sure that I didn't kill us. Because uh, it is just a different animal. Uh, Are there people in the back? Yeah. No, there's one person in the back when you do that. There has to be a circuit breaker watch in the back, basically. Wow. So, wow, that is, yeah. that is crazy. Um, what is one jet today you would like to fly in, no matter the branch or time period? Well, he says today. I'm going to say time period. I'm going to say, what jet would you like to fly, past, present, or future? Because that's a there's a lot of planes um, that I think would be cool to fly. But and, yeah. and I don't having the background I have is really unique in the sense that I've flown you know very different planes. So I don't have you know I don't I, my goal in my career was never to be that 90 year old guy sitting on the porch in a rocking chair going, I wish I could have been right. I, I wanted to know if I could, and and I feel like I know that. That being said. The Viper. If I had a chance to to get in an yeah. A10, uh, I would love to uh, fly in an A10. Uh, yeah. If for no other reason than to shoot the gun, uh, yeah, I, I think that would just be. Um, and I really think the mission is pretty cool. There's a lot of other planes, though. You know, aero wise, I think the F4 would have been awesome, just because it was like the old muscle car of aircraft. You know, forget aerodynamics and anything like that. Just put a ton of thrust, and we'll figure it out. Um, the OV-10 Bronco you and I have talked about, uh, I think that was an amazing plane for what it was. You could buy like. one. I mean, you're a rich guy you're like yourself. You could probably just get one now. Take, uh, all, the, take maybe, all the royalties yeah. from uh, t Treason Flight <laughs> Yeah, and buy yourself an OV-10. If everybody goes to the website and buys a lot yeah. of them, maybe. But you may see um, an OV-10 in the sequel. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's cool. So... Have you the started A10 writing the sequel? Bit. What's that? Have you started writing the sequel? I have. Okay. All right. Yeah. So. Wow. Um, things the Navy didn't tell you about flying, either good or bad. Um, how scary night landings are. <clears throat> and they did tell me, and I didn't believe them. Um, how much time you spend away and, and how how... Even when you're young and you think, what do I care, right? This is an adventure. You know, you, you have that kind of cowboy mentality. Um, you miss people, you know, like I'm, I missed my mom and dad, you know, when it, just the weirdest things that like, you're just not there. Um, the whole world goes on without you, you know, when you're out there on the ship. And like prison. It kind of, you know, but, but in the same sense, I look back at my life and I don't have any regrets at all. Uh, I do miss that I didn't spend as much time maybe with my, my parents, you know, because I was deployed so much, but I've met and have relationships with friends that, uh, that are, that are closer than family too. So, you know, there's always the good with the bad. Um, I think the, the main thing that the military, not necessarily from an aviation standpoint, I think this goes across all jobs that I didn't have an appreciation for was you assume everybody that you're working with is doing it for all the right reasons. And yeah. just like you think you are. And sometimes they're not. 
And just like in the civilian sector, people are out for their own thing. Um, and you have to deal with that. And that's sometimes I think a little bit more difficult in a rank structure environment, because in a civilian sector, if somebody's acting that way, I don't, I don't have to deal with you as much, but when that person's in charge of you, you now it's a whole different animal. So yeah, uh, a lot of, a lot of challenges come with that, but. Yeah, well, that's fair. So what is your favorite part now about being in the civilian sector, um, I mean, what's what's kind of the benefit of airline flying versus you know military flying? Like, how how did you like that transition, and kind of what do you think the, the benefits and cons are? I didn't like it initially, um, and I yeah. think a lot of military pilots deal with that. Um, we're so mission centric that you come out of that high op tempo and and, and I'm not talking just being on a deployment. I mean, it could be anything. I came from a training command and you're so driven by the mission. And then you get to the airlines and, and the whole mission is kind of what you never even thought about in the military, you know, takeoffs and landings were just part of the flight. It's admin. You didn't really, you barely briefed it. You spent very little time on it. You were accept, you know, you were expected that that was your job and you're going to do your job period. Um, so we have other things to focus on. And then you get here and, and that's your whole job. And oh, by the way, there's not the same camaraderie. There's not the, the feedback, you know, you, you finish a trip and you leave. Maybe the guy you're flying with or girl you're flying with is trying to catch a commuter flight and they're out of there. And you're just, I remember my first flight, I was, I was sitting in the plane and the captain's like, all right, I'm out. I gotta go catch a flight and walks out. I didn't know what to do. See ya. I just sat there. I was <laughs> like, well, do I have to, do I have to debrief with anybody or do it? I mean, nothing. You're just yeah. done. So Bye. that's the negative um, or the, maybe not even negative. Is, just is different. that a it's negative? No adjust. debrief. Mm. Well, <laughs> sure. uh, that, but that takes some getting used to. Yeah. Um, the positives are, uh, like I said, um, there's a lot more freedom. You can live wherever you want. Uh, your schedule is very flexible. Um, once I got introduced into the instructing, I can now take all of the things I learned from my background of, of 20 years of doing aviation and, and apply it to flying this particular plane. And, and right. I take a lot of pride in, in the students I work with. They're going to go out and they're going to fly your family from point A to point B and be safe. And is that as glamorous as, you know, dropping bombs or, or, or helping the, the individuals on the ground, not in a Hollywood aspect, but on a day to day, you know, my friends and family are on those planes aspect. Sure. You know, it's, yeah. it's, that's, it's just a different world and, um, and it gives you a lot more freedom. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that does make sense. And the next question, uh, from the kids at home, uh, is the E2 single pilot capable and qualified? Um, yes and no. It was really designed to be flown uh, by two, but you could do everything from, we would always, the, the pilot flying, if you will, was always in the left seat and that was for landing because the lens on the ship was on the left side. So um, I have taken up people that were not qualified in the E2 at all um, to sit in the right seat. I've had NFOs in the right seat, VIPs in the right seat. So I've done, you know, we that was something we would do, um, to where basically you're on your own up there and it was perfectly capable to do, um, no issues. You know, it was, it was a little different cause you're used to having your buddy there to back you up, but it wasn't impossible. The, the layout of the cockpit was such that you could fly it single pilot if you want. Yeah. Just never did. So, so um, You've already told many make them tell you no stories. Um, but what advice would you have for somebody, you know, high school, college, somebody's thinking about doing this job, either job, airlines or military, how to be successful as you were? You can never, never underestimate your ability. Um, my wife, I love her to death. She has the ability to tell me that I don't really know where my, my natural ceiling is in life. So, and I never have, 
Um, I, I remember when we first met, we were watching a, a comedy show or something. And, you know, there's a comedian up there talking and she's laughing. And I was like, oh, I could do that. And she's like, you genuinely think that you could get up on stage and make people laugh? And I was like, sure, yeah, I can do that. And to this day, a decade later, that's what she tells me she loves about me because it's just that ability to either not understand or be too stupid to realize where your limits are. I mean, I have no, my dad was an auto mechanic. My mom, they, they ran their own business, right? They were, they were hardworking. They showed me that hard work ethic. Um, you don't get to be a Navy pilot from that. That's not the natural progression, right? Uh, you don't get to be an airline pilot from that. You, you don't get those things. I mean, and, but I just never knew that. So I just kept going and people would say no and it would knock you back. And I mean, you know, constantly that's happened in my career and that's okay. Now I have honed that to where I almost thrive when it happens. I wasn't always that way. In flight school, in college, you know, somebody would tell me no and it would really set me back. Yeah. Now somebody tells me that and I almost just kind of smile because I've learned how to take that negative and turn it into like, you just gave me fuel. You know, you, thank you. Like I almost want to thank those people because now this has taken 20 years of my life, but I've figured out how to take that negativity and go, oh, it's, it's on now. Not only am I going to accomplish what you just told me that I can't, um, but I'm going to blow you away with how I do it. And I, that's just, that's how it is all the time. So, so take that negativity. There's always going to be people out there that are jealous, that are haters. There's going to be people that love my book. There's going to be people that hate the book. That's fine. Um, you know, the people that hate the book, I just ask them for a copy of their book so I can read what they've written, right? <laughs> no, Wait a minute. Seriousness. Why'd you ask for a copy of my books? What? <laughs> you just asked <laughs> for a copy <laughs> of my books. Yeah. Um, but no, that's really, I think the best piece of advice is understand that it's never going to be easy. Um, if it was easy, then you probably wouldn't want to do it in the first place if you're that type of person. If you have that gut drive down low, um, that gets you up every morning and, and gets you focused on a goal, you wouldn't want to do something that was easy. You want something that's going to be a challenge. And along with that challenge is going to come setbacks. It's going to come haters. It's going to come people that, that just genuinely think like, well, pff, who's this guy? I mean, I got in my whole career and I still get it. And I just, I've learned over the years, you know, the greatest power is to be able to take that hate and put it into fuel. Cause now, I mean, you're unstoppable because life's going to kick you. I hate to say it. I really do. I wish I could tell every one of your viewers that life is going to be pretty and comfortable and they're going to get everything they want in life on the first try, but it's just not reality. So, um, do you, yeah. do you have a copy of your book to show us like a physical copy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I can find one, uh, somewhere, but yeah, yeah there, you there you go. It's That's... backwards, but it, it's not backwards. It looks is perfect. It, it says Maybe TR Matson. It's backwards go. for you, maybe, but it looks, uh, well, you got a little E2 there. What's that in the background? A little Russian carrier? It's an American carrier. It was a, <laughs> it was a Russian carrier on the first edit of the book, but we fixed what's the, it. What's the, wait, 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 show me the author photo. Show me the, you got to show me the author photo. I want to see what, what T.R. Matson looks like. Yeah, America! Yeah, that's <laughs> And that's everything uh, America. You want. Sort of, so when is your piece of apple pie on that book? It's pretty much when do you, you when do you go on tour for your comedy uh, series? Or as soon as this video you? is uh, is out there, I'm sure the the people will be calling from Hollywood to get me out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You got a you got a comedy tour going. Um. So uh, one more question, I guess, because you love actually... the face that you make on some of the questions. <laughs> What was the hardest to learn in pilot school? Did you struggle with anything? I guess we already talked about the the motion sickness, but uh, was there anything? I struggled specific? with everything. Everything. Okay. I was not. I mean, things. I was as average <laughs> averages of, of a pilot as you could be. I really, there was no um, natural ability. No, it was just I had to work it at all. Um, yeah. But, you know, there are, there are aspects. Landing on a ship is not easy, obviously. Uh, 
you know, mid-air fueling is not easy, dropping bombs and shooting a gun and all that's not easy. Uh, but I mean, the whole thing was just, there was, I don't really remember in flight school, especially before I got my wings, a flight where I was like, that was a piece of cake. If there was anything that I enjoyed, believe it or not, which really just makes me sound cheesy, instrument flying. I loved, and maybe that was the only thing I was really oh, a little bit above average, but like you set me up on an ILS approach. I loved it because it was instantaneous feedback on how good you are. Like hmm. the needles don't lie. You're either on and on or you're not. Have you ever Sometimes flown with a 60 year old airplane? Because I can tell you they do lie. Well, I learned that <laughs> later in my career. Uh, they actually do lie later. a lot. They, yeah. So um, try flying them when the airport itself is moving, right? So there's yeah. a lot of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, there was, there was, I don't think there was anything that I really, uh, you know, just naturally came to me. It was just, I had to study, I had to prepare, I had to chair fly. Um, and there was a lot of luck. And, you know, but we make our own luck sometimes. So what you're saying is hard work actually pays off. That's it. Somehow. That's okay. all it is. People um, in my current job ask me, you know, how do you work as many days or hours as you do, plus raise a son, plus still in the reserves, plus write a book. And I was like, well, eh. you, know, you only need about six hours of sleep a night. Sleep you when get. you're dead. Yep. Um, Christian would like to know, well, Josh wants to put you on the spot here. Say a funny Navy joke, Mr. Comedian. <sighs> I'm not going to. <laughs> okay. I respect Mover's page too much for that. Yeah, I, I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, uh, but have you ever done any dissimilar, uh, like fought any like Eagles, Vipers? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we did uh, all of them. Uh, Eagles, Vipers, F-22s. Um, you know, we did it with our workups. We did. How'd you do against the Raptor? Uh, I never saw him, so. Okay. I, okay. I guess, yeah. I mean, I died really quickly, but yeah, yeah. never, uh, there, that's a pretty amazing plane. Um, yeah. the Viper was awesome in its own regard. Uh, I just felt bad for him sitting there pulling nine G's on the deck the whole time. That just looked painful, but, um, it is, it is, it is a little bit. Yep. Eagle is the Eagle. Of course. Eagle jet. Yes. So, um, are you as annoyed with inaccuracies in movies about flying as mover is? <laughs> um that depends are we making treason flight a movie because if we are i don't care how accurate it is oh dude we got to ruin it. treason flight that'll be funny <laughs> what are they doing here yeah that's fine they um, would never they would always use rank and last name they would never speak yeah, in call signs never use call signs it i think it's natural uh when you've done a profession any profession to watch that profession um portrayed in in a grand scheme like that, that it just, it irks you. And then as you know, you know, I mean, it's as we get further along and you look further back, it's like, all right, you know, cause Hollywood's come a long way too. Right. I mean, the, the, I want to believe that the accuracies of Top Gun two are a lot greater than Top Gun one, but that doesn't mean that the goal, I mean, what's, what's the goal of that? It's to draw people in and make money. That's it. Yeah. You know, so it, it served every one of the movies you have ruined in some facet have drawn people in and made money. So is it annoying? Some more than others. You know, um, I really do think that a good consultant that knows um, the latest movie you just did, Clear and Present Danger, there were definitely some accurate parts of that that to you jumped out right away uh, as there was somebody there. I think that's valuable because. Um, much like that critique I got where they said that, you know, there's no way Navy pilots use call signs. You know, I think that might have been hard for that individual to grasp. Yeah. But if I didn't write it that way, everybody who is a military pilot would immediately lose the story. They'd be like, this is. Yeah. What we well, I, that, oh, that, like, I, like I told you that time when I read Lee Child's first book and he's like, he took out three people with a shotgun blast and it's like, dude. Shotgun dispersion is like this, not. It's not easy. Like That's that. what makes it good. Yeah, right? maybe he yeah. had a different choke on the shotgun where it was more of a. Dude, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't. Physics, man, physics are hard. <laughs> but another question, 
Um, have you ever provided cast to soldiers or Marines in a tick? If so, can we know the story? Uh, I, I have, and unfortunately, no. Okay. But you may hear about a fiction version of that story at some point. Oh, uh, Gonky has corrected me. Uh, so, as you may know, there is there is a kinder, gentler mover uh, in the world today. And so Gonky has said that due to my new positivity, it now has to be Mover Praises movies and it'll be an instant hit. Which, by the way, if you have time sometime, I'll get you on and we'll do that 7500 movie since you're an Airbus guy. Oh, yeah. There's a, it's a, the hijacking thing. I haven't watched it yet, but I need to because I heard uh, it's actually good. Is it? I haven't seen it. Yeah, I know it's the kid oh. that was supposed to be Nightwing. So, um, yeah, so that must be good, right? Yeah, I guess. Do you think your book will promote more interest in flying E2s? I don't think <laughs> it can promote any less interest in flying E2s. So, I mean, will I think anything out there, um, it shows that there's other things out there than just, you know, sleek looking fighters. And um, I have gotten some feedback, some emails from my website where people are interested in it. You know, it's, it, it launches first, it comes back last, it goes somewhere that nobody really knows where it is, you know, so it's it's hard to... Um, Your book or the E2? Yes, the E2. <laughs> um, but, you know, so it's hard to really know much about the plane and the mission and all that. So I hope it sheds some light on it and gets people excited about it. You know, the E2's come a long way. Uh, you know, it was designed to be a uh, platform to intercept and find Russian bears, coming after the carrier. That might be what the question earlier was about awesome. ECU intercept. That's probably, they wanted yeah, to know if you'd done any intercepts I mean, that's like the, that. that was the sole purpose of this aircraft uh, when it was first developed, was it was going to find the bears coming from Russia, um, which I, I can tell you I've actually done, uh, which was pretty cool. Have you? And, yeah. Um, in real life, that's happened. So it still works for that mission. Um, but... Did you did you wave? I mean, did you guys flip each other off? We didn't join up on them, um, but we had, um, there are some things in the E2 that allow the pilot in the right seat to see some of the stuff in the back up front. Um, and they were tracking two Russian bears that were trying to come out and fly the carrier. And they would do, the tactic they would use would be a split tactic where they'd fly out in formation and one would go high, one would go low. And the, the idea was it kept the eyes on the high guy while the low guy snuck in and flew over the ship and we lost the low guy and i was just watching this display and i'm like he's right there i've been watching him the whole time and they intercepted him with some fighters and found him and it's a big deal to get flown over an aircraft carrier without fighter escort that is a big deal so um so we got him we helped him intercept it and luckily we didn't have our skipper of the ship get fired because he was the guy so uh, it still works great for that mission but what the navy has done since with it is is pretty impressive and the e2d is out there now uh it can mid-air refuel which is pretty darn impressive uh i can honestly say that i'm happy that it couldn't when i was flying it because that's a long flight and that i my hat is off to any navy pilot or any pilot uh that mid-air refuels an e2 that can't be easy to do so um, so it's definitely evolving and i think um Again, not to give away too much of the book, but at the time I was flying the E-2 was definitely a pivotal time in its history to where it was transitioning from this Russian bear intercept finder to what it is today. Um, and yeah. I think the community as a whole was looking for its place, and now it has found it. It's going to go forward. So. Uh, Chuck Scholdiner's left pinky asks... So I live in Norway, and glasses and contact lenses is normally not allowed. Do you think you guys think it means it's impossible, or is it possible I use both? I would Nothing's say impossible. make them tell you no. Nothing's impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, how do you have a healthy relationship with your significant other while in the Navy? Nothing's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I think he means... Not your boat girlfriend, but your your actual oh, the one the one in the um, back. And is it true so that that the boat makes girls hotter? I can neither confirm nor deny that. That's, okay. But, okay. Uh, it's not easy. Anytime you're away like that, 
uh, you're, like I said, you become closer to the people that you're working with than you are your mm-hmm. own family. So um, my advice on that is a relationship is no different than getting your wings or getting promoted at your job. It's the effort you put into it. Yeah. And now just as much as you could be in the wrong relationship. So no matter how much effort you put into it, it's not going to work for you. Just like you could be in the wrong profession. So no matter how hard you work at it, it's not for you. If you found the right profession or relationship and you don't put the effort into it, it's not going to last. So that's what it boils down to is you have to be willing to, like I said, there's 24 hours in a day. Arnold Schwarzenegger has a great quote where he says there's 24 hours in a day and you need to sleep six. And he goes, and everybody says, Oh, I need eight. And he goes, we'll just sleep faster. And that's really what it boils down to is sleep for six hours. And you got 18 hours to put into all of this other stuff, your job, your relationship, your, you know, your own development, all of that. And that's what it takes. So is it easy? Huh. Nope. Is it worth it? Like I said before, everything that's worth it is easy. So. Well, we need your motivational speaking tour to start right after your comedy tour. I mean, you got all kinds of tours to do. Were you ever intercepted on patrol? So I guess you did some intercepting, but have you been intercepted? Uh, the only time I've ever been intercepted is by people in my air wing sneaking up on the E2 um, and us looking out the window and seeing them there, which was a common thing to happen because the NFOs were very busy doing their job that they weren't looking immediately around our aircraft. And Of course, eight uh, people, five people. of the SA, five people. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So, wow. uh, well, sometimes you uh, lose the forest through the trees. Sometimes, of course. Yeah, that is a lot of a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Um, so before we let you go, um, where can we find your book? And is the audio book in work, or is it available? What formats are available? Tell us. Tell us how that we can make okay. Wombat a bestseller. And. That would be amazing. Uh, you know, so he can finally buy his OV10. Wow, that is uh, so. Or a or a car that's at least a little bit faster. I do need a couple more horsepower. Um, yeah. The book is available. It's available in all uh, media formats except for audiobook. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, Amazon, any place you go buy a book, you can find it. Search it. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother literally told me yesterday she saw it on Target.com, so she was very excited about that. I don't know if that. Apparently, that is the pinnacle of reaching well that's that's where the basic white girls can get your (laughs) well good they could also get themselves (laughs) a copy so um you can go to my website it's not i i don't sell directly through there but that has links for everything as well but um trmatson.com is the website i'm sure there'll be a link uh, in the video it is pinned it's pinned at the top of the chat here yeah perfect and in the description Um, yeah but yeah amazon you know apple books wherever you go it's out there i've tried to uh with your help Thank you for that. Gotten it out on everything I could. Um, so ebook, the hardcover is available. The paperback's available. Whatever you like is out there. Um, the audiobook is in the works, and I'm pretty excited about that. Are you um, reading the audiobook? I am not. And that is, did you get that question a lot when you told people you were? Because I get that question. That's the immediate first question. Is everybody well, like, are no, you reading? Well, it? I actually have had Noonan on the channel. And he read his own audiobook, and it feels because I know Noonan. So yeah. when I listened to the audiobook, I felt like I was on the phone with him. It was the yeah. weirdest like thing because I felt like I'm just talking to Noonan, but he's not answering me. He's talking about his other thing as he's going. But it's it's um, weird because that's the first question I get is, "Am I reading it?" The answer is no. Uh, you should. I give, you should. I give Noonan a lot of credit for reading his own book because that's its own art form. Uh, oh, I know. I, I just know. I, you can. Uh, yeah. I will stick to writing the story. Um, it should be out um, late summer, and I think I've heard some of it already. Uh, a couple of close friends have heard some of it, and I think you're going to be blown away. I have not heard any of it. Am I not in the circle of trust? You will be. You will. I'm just. Just. I mean, I'm offended. First of all, uh, right. second. I have now lost the question I was going to ask you because I am so offended by the fact that I am not in the circle of people that have heard this audiobook. Uh, did Gonky has Gonky heard it? He has not. Okay, all right. As long as I'm before Gonky, I'm okay with yeah. that. I mean, 
What has Gonky done for you lately? I mean, really. Very, very, not even lately, just in general, very lately. Well, he has had you on his channel. Yeah. And so I will point people, if you want to watch, what is it? You guys did like a three-hour interview, right? Y'all did a long... We did a, we did a multi... Now, it took him about four months to get it out. But well, yeah, right, was, but yeah, that's because uh, he's working on an Atari. I mean, he's got yeah. the old Apple IIe he's trying to edit it on. With We've done uh, one live and two... Uh, actual interviews that go through basically my career and, and everything yeah. I've done. Yeah, check check that out. We only scratched the surface, which, you know, I wanted to keep this light and, you know, sure. introduce you to it. But, uh, dude, thanks for being on the channel. Um, I think it's awesome that you're, you know, writing your book. What do, what do you think is the hardest part about writing a book? Believing that you can do it, honestly. Yeah. And then second to that would be finding the time to do it. Um, yeah. So you just have to, you know, there's going to be good days and bad days. You're going to feel like you're the world's greatest author some days and other days you're going to want to throw the whole thing out. Um, but my only advice is if you just write, just put it down, get it on paper, get it into a computer. Uh, the rest of the stuff that's not, especially as a self-published author is not fun, like cover art and getting it out there and formatting and editing, editing. and all the stuff that editing. you're going oh. through right now with the latest oh. book. Um, it's worth it because that story's there forever, you know, and, and uh, trees in flight, no matter what happens to me, will be there. It'll be there for my son. It'll be there. I mean, that story will be told. And that's to me, what's cool about it is it's there. So awesome. Awesome. Well, dude, Awesome. Great, inspiring story. Thank you for uh, sharing uh, your career and uh, your your book. I mean, it, that's going to be, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how it does. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping people will check it out, give some credit to the E2 community there and uh, maybe do some, uh, maybe, maybe this guy will be the next, uh, I don't know, Brad Thor, not Brad Thor. What's his, Scott Harveth? Or, uh, you know, Mitch Rapp, or is he a badass? He's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go, man. A little bit I'll tell everything. you if, uh, I'll say it right now to all your fans. If, if we get this book to any bestseller status, I'll come back on and do a giveaway. How about that? Of something special, not the book, something else. You should come back on and personally read the book to us. I, that would not inspire people. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no, I want it to be. I, you know what? We'll have Gonky read it to, aloud by a fireplace. Can he read? Uh, I mean, bigger, okay. bigger letters, bigger letters. Been, I'll do something special. If this, if this book takes off, I'll do something special, and I'll, I'll, I'll give back. We will hold that to you. I'll hold you Absolutely. to that. Hold it. But hey, by the way, you did say that uh, some of the proceeds are going to your charity of choice, right? Uh, yeah, so um, Wake for Warriors is kind of my jam. Uh, it is a organization that takes wounded veterans and their families out and teaches them how to wakeboard and wake surf. And um, it's a great organization. We'll link it here too, but uh, check it out, Wake for Warriors. It's it's uh, it's been amazing uh, to interact with them and to see the good work they do and the hard work uh, that goes into it. And just the it allows these, these veterans to just have a day off, you know, they, yeah. they have so much baggage, um, from what the military has put them through, getting them behind a boat and giving them that sense of satisfaction and accomplishment again, uh, is amazing. And I can't say enough good things. And if, ever, you know, if you have a dollar, please donate. It, it, it does such an impact. It's not cheap. Uh, I know personally the founder and, Wakeboard boats, believe it or not, are super efficient, not super efficient on fuel. So it is a high well, cost, high reward. Especially uh, now with fuel prices being what they are. Yeah. And uh, he's got some great sponsorships that really help out. There's some good organ there are good companies, Nautique Boats being one that's very close to them. Yeah. Um, but it isn't easy and he puts a tremendous amount of time. So uh, awesome. please go check that out too. But, awesome. Awesome. Well, dude, we appreciate it. Thanks to the uh, chat for everybody's questions. Uh, go pick up uh, Wombat's book uh, wherever you like to buy ebooks. Treason Flight, trmatson.com. Wombat.
We appreciate it, man. Take Mover. care. It was great. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Mm-hmm.